Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So you're about to see an interview between four YouTubers, uh, me, Matt Money, uh, Dave G and Scotto. And we had the privilege to interview Sir Peter Beck, CEO of Rocket Lab and Adam Spice, CFO of uh, Rocket Lab and ask them some questions uh, that the retail community is uh, interested in hearing. And I need to do this intro just so you understand the format. I messed up uh, the interview a little bit because I had the last minute misunderstanding and we were supposed to ask one question each and go around in circles. But instead it became that everybody asked their own uh, questions and then we went to the next person. And then we decided to release the video um, with our questions on everyone's channel. And then tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, we're going to release the full interview with a little bit of commentary or maybe the raw footage we haven't decided uh, on everyone's uh, channel. So on this video, I made it so that when you come to the end and it goes to the end screen, it's going to be Dave's video uh, that you can just click on and then it's like you're continuously watching. And I believe he, he made it so at the end of his video, you just click and then you go to Matt's video and then you click and then you go to uh, Scott's video. And I quickly have to apologize uh, because um, there was a lot of changes and uh, we recorded on a new platform and my camera quality is horrible uh, on this video and Sir Peter back also had some camera issues. Uh, some say it's because he was staring at the future and the future is very bright so he himself is very bright on the video but you're not here for the production quality, you're here for the data and boy does this interview deliver very good data from the company, you're not going to want to miss it. So. Let's go ahead and play the interview and enjoy. All right, so welcome everyone to a very special interview. We have here with us uh, Sir Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, and Adam Spice, the CFO of Rocket Lab. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with uh, retail investors. We really appreciate it. And congratulations on a very good quarter. Right, you. You know, thanks, guys. Yeah. All right, so I, I will go ahead and ask a few questions. I think this first one will be to uh, Peter. Uh, so we know that you're planning to land the first uh, neutron on a drone ship. And we know that generally you expect things once they're on the pad to work. But we are wondering how, what is the chances that you're going to be able to propulsively land on the first try? Or what? how many tries do you think it will take before we have a reusable neutron yeah well you've, you've you've kind of called out pretty much the only thing we haven't done before um so you know i, I think we should level set expectations there that there's uh you know there's there, there's some undoubtedly some learnings there uh the, the intent is to to do a soft splashdown actually on the on the first one not not try and hit hit the barge uh -huh. um so uh you know that that will be the intent and i think um it, it's a just a safer way to to learn a lot um because when you when you put a you know obviously a bit of steel between you and the rocket, um, if you haven't got it quite right, it, it it could be it could be you know pretty damaging to that 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 asset. So the plan for the first one is to do a you know soft splash down and uh, and and learn what we need to learn there. But I mean, uh, at least at least in in simulation, uh, you know the GNC team uh, have been have been flying and landing uh, neutrons now for, for for quite some time, and it's it's always cool to go past the you know the the hardware in the loop rig and see all the actuators actuating and and uh, you know it, it doing it doing its thing and, and landing. But you know it's probably the you know one of the things that we've never demonstrated before. Um, so you know we'll we'll kind of step our way into it. Do you have an idea of how many tries do you think it will take? Like five launches or eight launches before you can propulsively land and reuse the rocket? Well, look, we're hoping for one. I mean, you know, that's that's that that's the target. Um, but you know, it doesn't always work out that way in in this game. But um, but that that that's certainly the target. Awesome. All right. Uh, then the next question it might be to you or or Adam. Um, so th there seems to be a trend that more and more uh, countries are launching their own space programs. For example, Canada has recently announced their own. Um, at, the EU is uh, investing a lot in its uh, space systems, but it seems like that these countries are e increasingly favoring their own launch providers, even if they are way back in the development, way behind Rocket Lab or the other existing players. And my question is, do you see this as a headwind or 
uh, will you need to open up local launch pads, like for example, in the EU to be able to uh, get those contracts? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, a lot of country wants or countries want sovereign launch capability. And, um, you know, we've always said to, to countries, uh, there's, there's kind of a, a minimum number of launches that you need to, to put a pad in to make it viable. And, uh, you know, we, we've had these discussions with lots of, lots of countries around the world who, who want to attract, you know, us in, in particular to create a sovereign launch capability. But um, the conversations generally, uh, generally taper off pretty quickly when, you know, you explain to them that they have to bring their own sovereign launch um, because uh, there's no point in us going to, say, Europe and building a pad and then, and then cannibalizing our manifest from, uh, from, from other, uh, you know, or bringing our own, uh, you know, bringing our own, you know, customers along to fly out of that pad because it's just another pad that you have to amortize the cost of. So, um, you know, if a sovereign wealth nation wants sovereign launch, they have to bring sovereign payloads. Uh, and that, that's, that's generally where, you know, the conversations end because, um, you know, they, most, most sovereign nations actually don't have a big pipeline of, of sovereign payloads. All right, all right. Yeah, thank you so much for the color on that one. Uh, the next one is definitely to uh, Adam. Uh, you were on a conference um, last quarter and you got a question about the backlog and you said that uh, you managed to almost double the backlog uh, every year. And, and the internal mm -hmm. goal is uh, to, to still double, to go from 1 billion to, to 2 billion. However, at the end of Q2, the backlog was slightly going up and we, the retail community is hoping that this is because there's a huge pipeline of very lumpy contracts that still might come in this year, which would balloon the, the backlog to 2 billion. Uh, can you give a little, I, I know that you cannot say if uh, it is definitely the case, but could you give us a little color on how you see the backlog developing for Rocket Lab? Yeah, and we have our, you know, we have our oars in the water on, on big opportunities all the time, right? Commercial, government, uh, across space systems and across launch. So if you look at the types of deals that we're going after, it, it doesn't take a lot of squinting to see how you could, you could double your backlog from a billion to two billion in a relatively short period of time. I think the difficult thing is trying to predict, and I don't think it's a question of, of, of if, it's just a matter of when, right? And I think you don't stop at two billion, you go to four billion and you keep going as you grow the company. But I think that the the timing of these of these awards is very difficult to predict. I think on the on the space system side, obviously, there's been a lot of focus lately on the SDA opportunities, which has really created these new scaled platforms for for new entrants like ourselves. Um, and I think that you know just the timing of those are really difficult to to, to nail down. Um, but when they come in, like this last one for SDA beta was 550 million dollars. So you just need one of those, and that kind of gets you halfway to your goal. And then you know as we start to unlock lock opportunities for Neutron, now that we've gotten past some of these key kind of proof points, especially with the hot fire test, you know, those types of deals are also not looking at likely to be onesie, twosie launch deals, but much more kind of, you know, volume deals to tie up capacity on Neutron for some period of time. So to me, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's just inevitable that we'll be able to kind of build that kind of backlog. The question is, can it be done before the end of this year? I think that's kind of an artificial constraint that you know we probably don't really kind of operate under internally. It's just more like you know we'll sign the deals when they're when they're ready to be signed, and naturally, given the size of the deals, it creates lumpiness to the growth and backlog. But I think you know we all feel incredibly comfortable that the the backlog is going nowhere but up. Awesome, thank you so much for the color on that. So my last question is uh, to Peter. Um, so I've been reading a lot of space articles and it seems like like having your own constellation used to be a very big thing. And it was like a few governments who could only have a few uh, constellations. Uh, in the articles I was reading, uh, I read that the army and the navy wants to have their own uh, communication uh, constellation uh, because they feel that it's too much administration to share it uh, between them. Um, Greece wants to have an own uh, constellation to monitor the sea, and there's more and more companies and governments uh, that want it. And this space infrastructure that we are all looking forward to in um, Rocket Lab's future, could it be that it will be multiple constellations? And could it be that the army pays you, like they come to you and they say that, look, we need you to fix this service. We want uh, secret communication here, and we pay upfront for the constellation and you just operate it. 
Yeah, look, there's all kind of machinations of of the model, um, as as you kind of point out, and uh, and and yeah, as as you say, there's a tremendous amount of kind of growth from from the government uh, sector, and and you know we are we we we're, we're obviously trying to push very hard this model of just pro, pro, you know procuring a service rather than you know procuring satellites or procuring launch, and um, you know the the the, the recent kind of Victus mission. That we signed is a great example of that. Where you know they didn't they didn't buy a satellite, the government didn't buy a satellite, they didn't buy a launch. They actually bought you know in the end of the day, it's 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 a piece of data from a satellite satellite rendezvous. So that that's certainly where we're we're pushing things, and and frankly that that's where I think it it will all go. Not not just from a government perspective, but from a commercial perspective as well. Because if you look across um, you know the large some of the large tech companies who now have a footprint in space. They're not kind of natural owners of space assets um, and kind of, you know, it's very, very difficult to own these assets in orbit and operate them. You have to become, you know, somewhat of experts to, to even procure a launch. So um, so that that's that's where it's all gonna go gonna go in our opinion. And um we're just making sure that that we are gonna be the, you know, the the preferred provider of that by having, you know, the ability to build, you know, any kind of satellite at scale. And and of course, neutron is key. You know, excuse me, key to be able to launch it at scale as well. All right, thank you so much for the caller on this one. Uh, that was all my questions, so we can go to the next uh, speaker.